love for, for the lawyers up here to describe the use of conspiracy charges and how that works. Um, so I think that's, that's something that, like, as somebody who doesn't have any experience with the legal system in this capacity, um, that was the one thing I couldn't wrap my head around, is how, are, how is somebody who's been caught with an ounce of anything getting slapped with 10 years to life? Um, or how are they even being held and, and, and charged on the same sort of charges? So uh, could you explain that? Yeah, I would, yeah I'd love to, once again. Um, <laughs> so when you see these conspiracy charges come down, that's when you really kind of start to see the, the, the chess pieces, if you will, start moving. So another part of the documentary is a guy that apparently was only caught making one deal um, with, with a product weighed approximately one ounce, and then he's still caught up in this five kilogram um, conspiracy. So under federal law, if you are, anything that happened within a conspiracy is considered relevant conduct to that conspiracy. Any member of that conspiracy can then be held responsible for the entire dealings of the conspiracy. So I only moved one ounce, my friends that I knew what they were doing moved, you know, kilos, I can be roped into that whole kilo thing. Now, as, as, Mr. Jenkins, as, as Mr. Jenkins stated earlier, um, he started talking about the five kilogram cutoff, whether it would be a B1A or, or a B1B. That is a really big deal because those uh, charges under those, those statutes bring mandatory minimum sentencing, which is a very, very big deal. That also then reaches over into um, the practice of plea bargaining, which started to get much more acceptable in the 1970s. So what you have is indictments coming down with the highest possible charge, which brings across the highest possible mandatory minimums. And that's where you start to see them leveraging, the government leveraging the, the co-defendants to snitch, to tell another person and we will reduce your time. And if you have a mandatory minimum in the federal criminal justice system, there are two ways to get below that. One is a safety valve, which if you got a DUI, you're not eligible for it. You probably got more than two criminal history points, more than one. Now the First Safety Act has, has First Step Act has made the safety valve a little more easier to obtain. But the, safe, the, the, the safety valve is, is very hard to be eligible for. The only other way to get it is to cooperate. The only other way to get anything below a mandatory minimum sentence is to snitch, period. Um, and that's no guarantee that you're really going to get any time off at that point. One of the ways I am successful, I've come home and I've been successful. Uh, they, uh, if you want to capitalize on that, you can capitalize on that later today. Uh, I came home, I had two jobs. I'm a crane operator in Jasper, Tennessee. I've been a part of uh, many um, uh, community uh, um, outreach and community programs, speaking with the youth and speaking to the youth. But how I got there is I had to stop um, blaming, stop looking at, yeah, all those things are facts about what happened to us, what happened to our ancestors. Those things don't go away. But what they do create is they create a negative energy in me. And if I stay in that negative energy, it's hard for me to get forward. It's hard for me to grasp hold of the things that I could learn from somebody else, that I could learn from a white man or some or doctors or lawyers. While I was incarcerated, I surrounded myself with all type of people. When I walked in this room, one thing that I was appreciative of is that there was diversity. You know, and, and, and in diversity, you can learn a lot. But if I stay closed-minded, then I only, I'm only going to learn the things that the hood can teach me. And thus far, they haven't taught me a whole lot. They've taught me how to survive, survive in prison on a couple of occasions, survive in the streets on a couple of occasions. So yes, absolutely, we do have to take responsibility. Did I come up on this counter to say that I was innocent? Not one bit. I sold drugs for most of my adult life. But however, that is not the issue. The issue is with the 32 that it was unjust and that they went about it with lies and that they deceived the community in order to get criminals. I don't think that it's fair that you can act and prosecute by any means necessary, including criminal activity, just to convict criminals and over-prosecute them. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Uh, and we do see it every day. Um, but in, in coming to this open discussion, though, I do uh, just want to provide as much complete information as possible. And I certainly don't want to be seen as just, just pointing the finger. I do think that it is much more a systemic thing than it is a personal thing um, at this point. 
And I think, um, I don't want to jump the between uh, what happened with Sheriff Long and with I think it, it, it touches on a lot of other legal issues and, and racial sentencing disparities is just one of those issues. Um, I do think it plays a part. I think we can label it as race as much as we want to, but I think on a grander scale, it's a cultural thing. I think it is easy for a community to take uh, it easier to provide leniency for somebody that they see as their own. And when they don't see a group or an individual as part of their own, then, then they're, they're much more likely to be more hard on And that's, that's a fact. And, and I see it play itself out uh, in the courtroom on a daily basis. Now, that doesn't mean it was done consciously, though. But that means it is systemic, and it is happening every day. 